Good morning. Oh, wow. Thank you. That's uh, uh, a uh, pleasant welcome. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. I'm going to talk about Perform Python. Now, um, I'm slightly disorganized, and I forgot to bring batteries for my clicky thing, so I'll be wandering back and forth. Bear with me. What do I mean by Perform Python? Um, I'd like us to think about writing good, fast Python code. Now, there are three words in there, good, fast, and Python. And to my mind, they kind of have equal significance. So let's talk about good code first. Now, good code is complicated uh, as, a, as a concept. Um, we all know good code when we see it, right? Um, there's, there's all sorts of measurements you can apply, and there's academic literature about what is good code and what's not good code. As a working definition, I'll just say it's code that we can easily read and understand. Um, the next thing is fast code. Now, I love Python. I've been programming in Python for, oh, I don't know, since about version 1.6. Um, and there are lots of things I love about Python. But I don't write Python because it's fast, right? But it is fast enough for pretty much everything I need to do. And with a few tricks, um, it is actually fast enough for everything I do at the moment. Now, I have to kind of limit that slightly. My domain is um, mainly financial simulations. So, you know, I do floating point arithmetic all day long, and for that it's fast enough. If your domain is web services, I.O., huge databases, you might not get that much out of this talk, but bear with me, hopefully you'll enjoy it. And the last word uh, we wanted to talk about is, oops, Python. Um, we can, you know, there's the old joke about a good, pro you know, a real programmer can write Fortran in any language. And um, as a card-carrying C++ programmer, I can certainly write C++ or Java in Python. Um, and particularly when people write Java in Python with lots of abstract interfaces and abstract methods, it kind of irritates me. Um, but we can, so I want us to focus also on writing Pythonic code for, for a number of reasons. Um, one is because it's, it's uh, actually much nicer to read and write than C++ in Python or Java in Python, um, but also it's faster. So uh, let's move on with the slide that's gone out of um, sync. Before we talk about speed, let's reconsider the famous quote from Nuth. Um, Basically, 97% of the time, we shouldn't worry about small inefficiencies. Um, the 3% of the time that we should worry about them, it really matters. So bear that in mind. I mean, one of the things I'm trying to get across to people is that uh, my slides are out of, out of order. Never mind. <laughs> uh, that computers are cheap. Programmers are expensive, right? Um, you know, every now and then you hear about skills shortages, shortage of programmers. Have you ever heard about a shortage of computers? Recently? No. Okay, so let's move on. What do I mean by Pythonic? You've, has anybody ever done this, read this, the Zen of Python? Quick show of hands. Excellent. Most of you have. Those of you who haven't, just type import this at the Python prompt. You get a whole lot of this. Um, and I like the, the, the top three kind of make, make the most sense to me, right? Beautiful is better than ugly. Who could argue with that? Explicit is better than implicit. Um, I think that's also very important. And simple is always better than complex. Uh, I have to always tell myself I'm a bear of little brain and complex code bothers me. Um, who was it that said the, you know, debugging your code is 10 times more difficult than writing it. Uh, so if the code you write is as complex as you can write it, you have no chance of understand, of being able to debug it. Um, so that's always something I have to bear in mind. Uh, good, fast Python. Okay, so a couple of themes I'll, I'll come through here. Um, 
Pythonic, right? So by, my, my working definition of Pythonic, and I'm happy to have a philosophical discussion about this uh, over coffee later, is just uh, clean and readable. Uh, I will talk a little bit about profiling. Um, I don't believe the quote about that you can't manage what you can't measure. I think from a people management perspective, that's bullshit. Um, from a programming perspective, it is absolutely correct, right? There's no point making uh, any assumptions or building a hypothesis about your code unless you can measure what your code is doing. Um, once you have measured it, of course, um, the key things to speed things up is to do less. Um, the fastest, most reliable code, as somebody much more intelligent than I pointed out, is code that you don't write. Right? If code isn't there, it executes instantaneously, it has no bugs. So whenever you can do less, um, or jump ahead and cheat, uh, and get somebody else to do it for you, that is a win in, in, in programming. Um, the other two topics that come up a little bit later is uh, vectorizing and parallelizing. Slightly interchangeable. Um, vectorizing, from, a, from my perspective of uh, somebody who writes in a relatively slow language, and like his code to work quickly, basically means that uh, when we pass stuff off to, when we pass data off to um, a faster language or a faster subsystem, we do it in one go and operate on a whole batch of data um, to basically pay the overhead of, of, the, co of the call only once. Um, and obviously parallelizing means using as many cores or computers as you can. So let's go back to Python performance. Now, you know, on, on the interwebs and all that, um, you constantly hear about this Python is slow compared to X, Y, Z. What does it mean? Um, you know, I, I don't think that's, you know, Python being, being slow isn't really an issue. The question is, is Python too slow? I don't think it is for any, anything that I do, and I do a fair bit of, you know, performance-sensitive stuff in that domain. Um, and, you know, we, we have a couple of hundred thousand lines of library code, um, and most of that is not performance sensitive at all. Um, there are a few hotspots uh, where we do worry about performance, but once you worry a little bit about them and, and deal with them properly, um, it actually turns out that Python is fast enough. So let's look at some code. Um, Hopefully that's big enough for the people in the back to see. So this is, this is kind of, you know, Python 101 code. This is the kind of code I would have, would have written in 1999 when I started Python programming. And, you know, it's, it's simple, it's clear, it's readable. It works. You know, all, all three of those are um, pretty, pretty good attributes for a little piece of code to have, you know, as a starting point. Is it fast? Well, let's write a little gadget to measure it. Um, this is probably not dissimilar to IPython time it. Uh, how many IPython users in the room? Cool. Why don't you, why don't, like those of you who don't use IPython, why not? <laughs> I mean, I don't use the notebooks myself, but as a command line, you can't beat it. Um, so let's look at this code, right? So if I run this, and if we, a little bit of test code there, I'm going to run Ten, add up 10 million random numbers, and it comes back in just over half a second. That seems pretty damn quick to me. Um, you know, I hate to play the old man card here, but you know, the computers I started programming on couldn't even handle 10 million random numbers, much less add them up in half a second. So that's not too bad. So why are people still worried about Python performance? Well, they're worried about Python performance compared to C++ or C, right? Um, so let's look at the same program in C. Boo, hiss. Um, nobody, nobody hates C? Okay, good. I'll take my C++ jokes out later on. Okay, um, so this is very similar. Um, but if we time it, we find out that it is um, about 40 times faster than our Python program, which is a bit irritating. 
um, you know, just for bragging rights over the coffee if you talk to a C++ programmer, or if you really have something very time critical. So let's have a look at this code again. This code is actually pretty much exactly the same as the C code. Now, I think we can make it faster by making it better. So if we just go to a slightly more modern, more Pythonic style, and instead of you know using random access, iterate, uh, stop again. Uh, instead of using random access and using um, uh, a C style for loop, if we just use a um, proper Python for loop and iterate over a collection, is actually I think a little bit faster. Let's have a look. Uh, oh yeah, um, the other. So uh, to me, this is kind of the the canonical perfect um, Python function um, for, to do a sum. The you know the current fashion is for going all functional programming. Um, so I did write a functional version of it. Not desperately keen on that myself, but you know, as a follower of fashion, I had to put it in. Um, so does does does. Um, changing it, changing your code to make it more Pythonic actually make it faster. I'm running out of time. Yes, it does. So if you look at the the second line down, you know we've got a 100%, well 50%, whichever, whichever way around you measure it, um, in performance improvement by making our code a little bit simpler, a little bit cleaner, a little bit tidier, which is great. But it's still about 20 times slower than C++. OK. So hmm. So let's think about what else we have in our arsenal. Uh, and obviously, you all know Python, so you know that we have a sum um, function built into Python. And we should just use that instead of reinventing the wheel badly. Um, and that takes us to pretty much the same ballpark as C++. It's still a little bit slower, but you know, at least we're in the same town now, right? So I think you know this kind of shows that actually, if you write Python properly uh, and know the language and use the facilities in the language, you're going to get something that's you know, I don't know, three or four times slower than C++. But that isn't you know an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude so it's you know for most things it's probably not something you have to worry about but we have a few more um tricks up our sleeve so this is what i do at work <laughs> i uh, i basically use numpy um and this is this is what i kind of mean by cheating right so i don't want to write c plus plus code all day um why not because you know writing optimized numerically efficient c plus plus code it's hard work. I'd much rather get somebody else to do it for me, and the nice people at NumPy have done that. Um, so this is really good. Now let's look at the performance of that. Uh, we're cheating slightly because we're we're converting from a Python uh, list to a NumPy array because it's a more efficient data structure. But glossing over that, we're actually faster than C++. Uh, that surprised me a little bit last night when I put this slide together. Um, but you know, it's so. This is kind of what I, you know, what we do all day, and it's not very surprising, because we're, uh, you know, we're comparing C code written by somebody who hasn't really written C for a living for 20 years um, to some of the best C++ programmers in the world, and they're faster than I am. That's great. So there's other things we can do though, because sometimes NumPy is a little bit awkward to use if you're not using. Um, you know, if you're not doing uh, basically matrix arithmetic. Um, so we can cheat again in a different way. Um, oh, we've vectorized. We've gone Pythonic. Let's cheat. And this is the slide from before. We see Python. If we use PyPy, we get, uh, <laughs> with any of the version of the code, we're just as fast as the C++ code. So, you know, if you have a performance problem, look at some of the new JITs out there. Um, PyPy is great. Um, <laughs> you know, we didn't even have to worry about rewriting anything. I mean, I still think you should write the more Pythonic version of the code. 
but the performance gain you can get from cheating with PyPy is fantastic. So let's look at that. Um, now there's something different about this slide from the previous slide, um, and that's the fact that we're missing the NumPy version. Now PyPy and NumPy haven't, um, have had problems integrating in the past. Um, they're slowly getting better. I, I mean, I, I, you can actually now install NumPy and PyPy together, and it works. I just didn't have a chance to try it on my laptop um, before coming to do these slides. Um, yeah. The kind of other um, thing you might want to look at uh, if, if you want to look at a JIT is, is NumPy, number, which is, gives you a number of um, deployment opportunities to, to use GPUs uh, if you have the kind of problem that fits the GPU. Now, in my experience, that's one of those situations where if your problems fit the hardware architecture, it's fantastic, um, but it has to be a pretty close fit of your problem to the hardware architecture, so your mileage may vary. Let's move on. That was a cheat. And remember this. Uh, now, <laughs> it's interesting, this quote has probably been stolen more than any other quote I've run across from a uh, quote checker. Uh, so I've seen it attributed to Picasso, Tennyson, and Jobs. Um, I don't really care. Um, <laughs> if it's good enough for any of them, it's good enough for me. So I think the key, one of the real key things to getting your Python code files is to actually you know, see what other work is out there already, check uh, what you can take from other people, and uh, use it and improve it. Moving on. Profiling and doing this. So, Let's start with some really not a naughty code. Um, so these are anagrams. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they used to be something that people did before the internet was invented uh, to keep themselves amused at night. Um, but they're, they're really tedious to work out by hand. Um, quite fun sometimes with political uh, developments. Um, but anyway, so let's, let's see if we can get a computer program to work them out. So what do we do here? We, um, first of all, read the list of dictionary, our dictionary. So we have a list of all the words we want to look at. And then we have a very simple kind of list, uh, program to find all anagrams. Now, let's look at this. So, you know, A um, couple of things about this code. It works. And it was really, really easy to write. Um, now, you might not believe me that this works, but I do have unit tests to prove me see me afterwards if you really don't want to. Um, so if we just look at um, how fast this runs, then uh, again, we're, we're looking at a little timing harness. You know, if, you, if you're just interested in finding a few anagrams, pff, this code runs in sub-seconds, blah, 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 it doesn't matter. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, you know, do this a lot, then you start having to profile. I think that's uh, useful to remember. Um, you know, it's only worth spending time on uh, speeding up code that's actually used a hell of a lot, right? If you run the program once a week and it takes five hours, pff, who cares? If you run it all the time and it has to run in three hours, then you have a problem. So let's, let's measure this. Um, so this is using Python 3 on an old laptop. It takes one minute, 14 seconds. Um, you know, it's not, not slow, but um, interestingly enough, when I ran this in Python 2.7 rather than 3.4, it turned out to be faster. Hmm. Not so good, <laughs> because we all want to you know, switch over to 3. Uh, another poll, who's still using Python 2? Ooh, is anybody still using Python 1? No, okay. Okay, all right, so about half of you are using Python 3. Um, can I just point out this is, this is not a general, um, general rule, Python 3 isn't generally slower than Python 2, so that's, you know, go and upgrade, get home, you know, get back to the office, switch over to Python 3, the world will be a better place. Um, so let's 
run this in PyPy, and yeah, okay. We've gone from you know one minute something in Python 3, uh, or 40 seconds in Python 2, to 22 seconds, which is pretty damn good, you know, for uh, for not doing anything apart from changing the command line. Um, but let's let's assume that you know we have a really mean boss, and he says 22 seconds are still too long to find all the anagrams in the English language. Um, so let's look at profiling. Now, Python is great. Python has a profiler included, uh, just so I can gauge how quickly to go through the profiling slides. Who knows the profiler? Okay, right. The rest of you should learn it. It is worthwhile knowing. So. The Python profiler is really, really simple to use. I don't know if you can see this. Um, really, all we do is call Python minus M to invoke the module C profile, um, which invokes the profiler. And that spits out a huge text file here. Um, your IDE probably has it included anyway. So just have a quick look and, and run it. And that spits out a file that looks a bit like this. Now, I don't have my laser pointer, but Basically, what it shows us the number of calls, the time spent, the time spent per call, the time spent um, in the function and in any function it calls, and then the file name and the line number. And you know, unsurprisingly, um, if you look at the cumulative time column, we spend pretty much all of our time in the find all anagrams functions. Now, in this case, that's not terribly useful. If you're profiling a big program, obviously finding out what functions take all your time. Um, is, the, is the first step. I mean, there's no point optimizing all the functions you have. You need to kind of apply your time sensibly. So um, let's see if we can do better than this. Um, you know, if we just look at this function, we can't really tell what's going on here. Let's see what other tools we have. Now, um, there's another profiler which sadly doesn't come installed with Python by default, but is easy to install, pip install line profiler. Takes no time at all. Um, all you have to do is do an at profile decorator on the function that you've previously identified as a hotspot, and then um, we run kernprof. So it's a slightly different command line, not too difficult. And this gives us some really interesting output. So. First of all, it tells us how often each line of the function is executed. And that's, in this case, isn't terribly surprising. Um, what is, I mean, sometimes I find the, actually the hit count more interesting than the timings, because the hit count kind of tells you where the hotspots are. But in this case, you know, all our time, 99.4% of our time is spent in this if candidate and dictionary uh, lookup, which is slightly, uh, Surprising. Um, well, it was surprising until I thought about it, and you guys probably have figured this out already. The the problem is we're doing a linear search in a dictionary inside a linear, you know, inside a for loop. So n times n gives us no n squared algorithm. Not a great idea if you have large numbers of items. Um, so we can make a one line change to this function, which speeds it up dramatically. Um, and this is, again, slightly cheating. So we just change it to a set of words. Uh, it's slightly cheating because when I say it's a one-line change, actually, we're fundamentally changing the data structures that the program operates on. But Python makes it nice and convenient to do that in this case. So we're looking pretty good. Um, and that now runs in 1.4 seconds, which is, is uh, yeah, I think, fast enough compared to the one minute, 14 seconds that we were looking at earlier. There's a slight um, surprise I had after this when I ran it in PyPy. Um, and the PyPy version was actually slower. Now, I mean, you know, that isn't, isn't terribly surprising if you, if you think about it a little bit, because a JIT takes, takes warm up time and has to do some more work than the interpreter. And if your program is running, you know, has such a short execution time, then it doesn't have time to amortize that afterwards. Um, but yeah, anyway, so there we go. We have, uh, with a very simple change, come to the end. The end. Okay. <laughs> oh, sorry, did I miss this part? Okay.
It's okay. Well, thank you very much for bearing with me. No time for questions? Okay, well, I'll be around uh, for the day, so if you want to grab me, grab me. Thank you.